Today I tackle three amazing questions. Who is God? What is God like? And what does God do? And I begin with some thoughts. First, people cannot fully understand or define God. We're limited in our ability to understand the universe, and God is even bigger than the universe. We can, however, know exactly and accurately many things about God because He has given us that capacity and has told us much about Himself. Now we must carefully search the Bible to know, worship, and to serve the true God of the Bible. To make sure we worship the right God, we cannot rely upon our imagination, our dreams, or what others have said. But put simply, if we do not worship the true God, then we worship a false God, and the consequences of that action are terrible. Second, God is not just a perfect exalted man, a state that other men will someday attain. He is not an impersonal force in nature, nor just one of several gods or spirits. The God of the Bible is the one and only true God, a living spiritual being who is active and personal. He has an elect emotion, will, and enjoys fellowship with his people who are created in his image. On the one hand, God is outside of his creation and governs it from afar. On the other hand, God is actively involved in the detailed workings of his creation. And finally, God does exist. The Bible assumes it, and mankind intuitively knows it. Well, mankind throughout history and in every culture has the intuition or heart knowledge that God exists. Their notions were false, but they still had a belief in God or gods. And I submit to you the true and only God is the God of the Bible who gave a special revelation about himself and confirmed his testimony with mighty miracles, the greatest being the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And now for question one, who is God? Well, one key section to set before us is Exodus 3.14. It says, And God said to Moses, I am who I am, and he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God had many names in the Old Testament, each described a characteristic about himself. But here we have the name Yahweh, translated usually as Jehovah or Lord. And the word means the existent one, or better, the self-existent one. This means that God's existence does not depend on something other than himself. For example, a fish depends upon water, animals depend upon air and food and even parents to produce them. And everything in this universe depends on something for its exist existence. Not so with God. He is the self-existent one. The life itself is sourced in God. And God has no limits or boundaries to time or space. He is unchangeable, the same yesterday to ever and forever. God is perfect. Now let's compare ourselves to God. We have many imperfections. People, governments, businesses, and families are all imperfect. We were limited by time and by space. And the days of our life are limited. Some of you have passed only your 20th birthday, some of your 40th, others have passed 60 or 70. Someday, who knows, maybe tomorrow, today, next year, but someday the funeral will be yours and mine. What we do in this life is limited by distance, money, health, and status in life. For example, we may yearn to visit our family who lives far away, but we lack the money. And not only are we limited, but we are also totally dependent upon God. Our existence, life, health, food, shelter, the air we breathe, all come from God. We live in a fragile world and fragile bodies, utterly dependent upon God. God is self-existent, all-powerful, and all-wise, and He is everywhere. He is merciful, kind, loving, holy, and just. And now we come to a difficult subject, the Trinity. Now the actual word Trinity is not used in the Bible, but this complex teaching is clear and also is a central doctrine of Christianity. Now when the Bible teaches that God is a Trinity, it does not mean there are three gods, or that there is one God who acts out in three different ways. And certainly the Bible does not say there are three gods and one God at the same time. The Bible teaches that in the nature of the one true God, there exists only three eternal, co-equal persons who fully share in one nature, yet are distinct in their existence. 
there is the Father, there is Jesus Christ the Son, and there is the Holy Spirit, and they're all called God. And the verse that puts it together the best is Matthew 28:19, where the disciples are to baptize in the name, singular, of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, plural. No illustration in creation can fully illustrate the Trinity, but this is helpful. There's the sun itself, and then the sunlight by which we see the oceans, deserts, and islands. And finally, we see the energy of the sun that grows the grass, the flowers, and the trees. All possess the same qualities, yet all are, dis are distinct. In the final analysis, it's impossible for us mere mortals to completely understand the nature of God. And the issue is like this. The Bible teaches there to be one true God. However, it refers to the Father as God, Jesus Christ as God, and the Holy Spirit as God. So when Christians refer to the Trinity, we are not making up something, but we're trying to explain the best we can what God has revealed about himself in the Bible. And the teaching of the Trinity is not a contradiction, but a complexity. If we are to worship the God of the Bible, then we must believe the Trinity. Otherwise, we worship another God with tragic results. So let us now turn and take up the second question of what is God like? Well, the first of seven qualities I explained is that God knows everything. He does. God knows all about science, languages, history, the future, everything there is to know about everything. There are no secrets. God knows our thoughts. He knows what the price of rice was 20 years ago what the gasoline price was last year and what it will be next year and who or made or lost money. He knows who graduated from college, he knows who cheated, who stole, who cried, had surgery, died, even who vacationed in Europe. God knows everything about you and your circumstances. Now secondly, God is all wise. He knows what to do and how to do it. He does not wring his hands and worry about the holes in the ozone the population of the world, the arms race, or even global warming. We worry and fret about many things in life, and we do things wrong, and we make mistakes. But God he is all wise. He is never at a loss for knowing what the right thing to do is. Now third, God is good. He is generous and kind to his creatures. God causes the rain to fall and the food to grow for all of his creatures, both good and evil. The sun never ceases to come up. He gives the abilities and, and medicine to doctors to cure the diseases. Well now fourth, God is love. And the kind of love that we speak of is that which seeks the best for the object love. It's not lustful or selfish. And God's love is displayed in his undeserved favor and grace towards a rebellious mankind. He has mercy, pity, and compassion upon the helpless. He's patient. And the greatest display of his love is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we were rebels, indifferent, and even enemies of God, in Romans 5. Fifth, God is holy. God himself is the standard of right and wrong. He hates sin, and he demands purity in his creatures. God is distinct from all his creatures and stands above them in absolute pure majesty. God does not leave it to governments or to anthropologists or judges to decide right or wrong. In fact, he didn't leave it up to school teachers or mothers or fathers or brothers or sisters or government or workers or public opinion calls to decide. God himself has a standard of right and wrong. Sixth, God is righteous. He is the ruler of the universe, and in that position God will reward good and he will punish evil. Many times we wonder why evil people seem to get away with evil deeds while the innocent people fall on hard times. Don't fret over justice. God in his perfect righteousness will reward good and punish the evil. If not in this life, then certainly in the next. Count on it. Sin will not go unpunished. Goodness will not go unrewarded. Seventh, God is true. All other idols, religions, and gods are false. God is faithful and he's honest to his word and his people. And the Bible says that God cannot lie to us. Many times people lie to us, even our spouses, our friends, or family. But God is always straight and he will never lie nor deceive us. 
Now for our third question, what does God do? Well, you and I cannot possibly know everything that he does, but here I will describe three activities he is or was involved in, creation, governing of the universe, and redemption for humanity. Well, first, God created everything. He is all-powerful, and he created the universe out of nothing, Genesis 1.1. God created both the ocean, the mountains, the islands. He created the pigs, the chicken, the fish, the coconuts, the mangoes, the cows, the horses, the sky, everything, even mankind. He made us like we are and he gave us life. He made governments and nations and Asians and Europeans and Filipinos and the Indians. God worked with Adam, the first man, in naming the animals and the birds. What sweet fellowship they must have had together. Can you see God in your mind's eye bring the little pigs and the horses and the chickens and the turtles and, and goats up to Adam in that fertile field with the rich black soil and the big fruit trees and saying, what do you want to name this, Adam? Well, Adam would say, well, God, let's name this fuzzy little thing a cat. And we can call this one over there a dog. And that one over there we can call a cow. Well, secondly, God is sovereign. He is the absolute and only Lord, Master, and Ruler of the universe. He works all things by His own design, not by the plans of men or devils or governments or any other created thing. Not even a committee or the United Nations. God has one perfect plan for His universe, and He's unfolding that plan with absolute perfection and precision, even this very minute. And not only does God guide the big, the big things of the universe and the world, not only does he create the history of nations, but he unfolds our actual history as well. He planned out the day that you were born and the place that you took your first breath. And he even put you together inside of your mother's womb in Psalm 139. The Bible says that all your days in this life were numbered in God's book before you were even born. God is the God who makes history, my history, your history, South Pacific history, New Zealand's history, and America's history. Remember this, God directs the affairs of humanity. God makes history and he has right on schedule his schedule. God rules the world, not Satan and his demons. Now true, they raise havoc and God has temporarily permitted them to do some limited things. But God is in full charge and authority. So trust God and leave the worry to someone else. Trust and obey. Third, I speak of God's redemption. Mankind fell into sin in the Garden of Eden. He was corrupted by that awful disease the Bible calls sin. And sin carries a dreadful penalty, death and punishment. Now Adam's corruption was passed on to mankind because we are all his offspring. We all fall under the judgment of God. But in His great mercy and love towards us, God planned and provided for our salvation. God sent Christ to save us from sin and His terrible penalty. Christ died a bloody death on the cross and He rose from the dead that He might give full, permanent forgiveness of all sin for all time and then give eternal life to all who will receive Him. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Now in another place he said, These things I have written to you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5.13 What incredible news we can know in this life, whether or not we are saved and have eternal life. Now, maybe you are one who has never received Christ as your Savior. You can. You need to if you want to go to heaven when you die. Now, receive Him today. I urge you. And for the believer, since we are created in the image of God and are being conformed to the image of Christ, then let's live like God wants us to live. Let love and compassion and mercy and kindness be the mark of your life. And let us live holy lives, confessing and putting away our sins, not to become Christians, but because we are Christians. Love God, love people, love His Bible, love His church, love your wife, your husband, love your children and your parents, love prayer. Now this ends the lesson about God. Who is He? What is He like? And what does He do? 
So I invite you to go to our website for the written script of this lesson with all the Bible verses. And again, I encourage you to browse through the many free articles and affordable books that you see there. The books have been priced very low, and the contents are easy to understand. And we use them in our Bible colleges all around the world, and we offer them to help you flourish in your Christian life. Just go to our website and click on the section ebooks and bookstore. BibleTeachingAbout.com And since this is a Christian ministry, we also ask for your prayer and for your final support. And so until next lesson, may God richly bless you.